This episode of the podcast is brought to you by J.D. Chapman Insurance Agency. Are you an aspiring business owner or entrepreneur looking to be part of New York's multi-billion dollar cannabis industry? If so, the decisions you make in these early stages are imperative to your future success. And I'll tell you from personal experience that you will face risk on a daily basis. So it's important to have a comprehensive insurance program in place with a trusted, reliable partner. J.D. Chapman offers special insurance for cannabis growers, medical and adult use dispensaries, edibles manufacturers, testing labs, ancillary businesses, and more. Available coverage includes general liability, product liability, excess liability, and workers' comp. In this exciting and rapidly growing industry, it's important to have a partner you can trust. Contact J.D. Chapman today at 315-986-4062. For all your cannabis insurance needs, J.D. Chapman from Seed to Sale, they have you covered. The views and opinions expressed on this show belong solely to the hosts and their guests and do not reflect the views of any outside institutions unless explicitly stated. What's up, everyone? My name is Steve Vandewall, and I'm the host of Cannabis Cum Laude, a podcast devoted entirely to cannabis. This podcast will cover a full spectrum of topics, including cultivation, business, medicine, politics, culture, advocacy, and everything in between. Because let's face it, the cannabis industry is very complicated. It's robust, and it has a ton of moving parts. So it's going to be my job to help you understand it a little bit better. So tune in every week for a brand new episode. And if you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review the show. And if you really, really, really like the show and are interested in sponsoring, please shoot me an email at logistics at cannabiscumlaude.com. Now enjoy the show. What's up, everybody? This is Steve here from Cannabis Cum Laude. We're here at Innovation Square in Rochester, New York for the Cannabis Workshop and Education Series. Huge lineup of speakers over the next two days from local politicians, local legislators, uh, industry experts, real estate experts, uh, and some really awesome people here joining us uh, to enjoy the plant and to enjoy the rollout of what could be the biggest, most successful industry, cannabis industry in the country, and that's in New York State. Uh, so stay tuned uh, for some footage from the event. Those were some of the highlights from the day one workshop. I had the opportunity to chat with some of the speakers to pick their brains on some of the bigger issues surrounding the New York cannabis industry. First up, real estate guru and CEO of Who's Holdings Co., Barrington Rutherford. So, Barrington, you come from a real estate background. Talk a little bit about your real estate background and how that led you into the cannabis industry. So, my entire adult life, I've been in I've been in real estate. I started developing real estate when I was in my you know very very early twenties. And I started in residential, but but soon moved into commercial. And I think one of the things that was, uh, you know, that sort of came full circle uh, for me in the cannabis industry was in in commercial real estate, I was always looking for opportunities to um, go into blighted communities where there were good value opportunities. Frankly, it's just good business, right? So um, the undervalued. Uh, real estate is often found in communities of color, and and in many cases, um, you're able to find, you know, strong corners like that are good retail properties, and they're just, you know, they suffer from a lack of investment just because of the fact that they are in communities of color. Um, 
so finding unearthing those opportunities and then finding opportunity finding you know good good development opportunities good businesses that are willing to go there is, has just always been something that I was passionate about and so when many many years later when when I um, became interested in cannabis what seemed to me the opportunity was that cannabis dispensaries were going into like the back left corner of town right like they were people were opening these retail stores in industrial parks and it just makes no sense right and it particularly made no sense when you've got these you know you've got urban communities you've got communities all over the country that have really high quality retail sites and they're just overlooked because they are in black and brown neighborhoods and so you know one of the commitments that I made to to myself and and to um, the leadership when I came into the industry I came in as the head of real estate for Cresco Labs and so one of the commitments that I made to leadership there as well as uh, you know to myself was that I would never put a dispensary in the back left corner of town when there are prime corners available when there are prime retail spaces available we would not overlook them because of the demographics of the community that that the real estate was located in and I think that was you know I, I think that has served us um, I think it served the industry really well I think in the in the places that that I've been a part of the growth of the industry and the growth of retail opportunities in the industry you'll see that you know we've never we've never put a I put more stores next to Starbucks than I have next to you know, something that's uh, sort of inappropriate from a, like, sort of, like, land use perspective, yeah. right? Like, I've, I would never put a, a dispensary in, in, a, in an industrial park. Why would you? That's right. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, cannabis is one of those things where, you know, we're not only building a business, but you have an opportunity to build entire communities that, quite frankly, really need it. We're seeing it here in Rochester, where, you know, the North <laughs> Corridor really needs some economic love, and we're trying to figure out how do we incentivize businesses to come set up here, where normally they would, complete, they would completely overlook it, like you said. So, um, I think, you know, I think from like a, from, the, these are, this is the kind of thing that, that you can ask the city to do, right? Like, in many cases, I think cannabis is an industry that that needs really just the permission to operate, right? Like it, you don't. It doesn't require a ton of public funding the way like large and most large industrial like um, development needs, or even some retail development. Like this needs permission to operate. So if the city can lower barriers, like you know don't require a, a long, arduous, special use process, right? Like, make it a, make cannabis retail a buy right use in, in you know, certain, in, in the areas that you want to, where, where you want to see it happen. It cuts the timeline down, it cuts the cost down for, for entrepreneurs, for, especially if you're uh, embracing social equity or legacy to legal entrepreneurs. It's a, it's a really important way that, that municipal government can support the development of the industry. And you and I both know you don't need 10, 20, 50,000 square foot to make a living in this building, you know, in this business. People have been hustling out of their houses, out of their basements since Prohibition, you right. know, 80, 80, 90 years ago. So, you know, making sure even if you have a little house or some sort of small space, letting, you know, the transition from legacy to legal is going to be what I think is going to be the success to the industry. But you're right, we got to lower barriers to entry. We got to make sure that license fees are, you know, unaffordable. We need to make sure things like all the legal and compliance is maintainable for people who are just getting off the ground. Because when you do that, you know, and you really start to see this influx of legacy operators. I think that's really where the, you know, that's where the heart and soul of the industry is. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I also think like, you know, you mentioned licensing fees. Like, make the licensing fee like paid in the middle of the year instead of at the at the moment when capital is most precious and when when an entrepreneur is spending the most on everything like don't you know i don't know that you even have to like the municipalities don't even have to necessarily discount the fee just don't charge it on day one or a payment right? plan or something yeah, you know exactly. 50 bucks a month 100 that's, bucks a month you know? that's absolutely right like there there are many ways that i think that um, municipal leaders can be creative about this is an opportunity this industry presents the opportunity for win win wins Agreed. everyone can win yeah. here there's right? plenty of pie for there's everyone there's plenty of pie here right so the municipality can generate the fees that it wants and the entrepreneur can pay it in a way that's sensible right like there's there's the opportunity if you know to be creative and yeah 
Uh, so let's transition over to Who's Holdings. Uh, what is Who's Holdings and what's your role in that? So Who's Holding Co, Ho Who's Holding Company, is a, uh, is a cannabis-focused investment firm. We are uh, headquartered in New York. I'm the CEO. And we are looking for great opportunities to invest in the cannabis industry. We have a particular focus on um, businesses that um, are making the transition from legacy to, from the legacy market to the legal market, uh, and and really, frankly, any business that meets the social equity standards that are that are set forth in the in the state where they're operating. So we'll look at deals everywhere. We're also we're certainly open to plant touching opportunities, but willing to look at the more sort of uh, picks and shovels type businesses as well, right? Like we, I think um, there are tremendous opportunities in this industry for um, technology companies, and I mean, really all sorts of. That's, that's one of the things that I think is is most exciting about the industry is that you can do the thing that you are already passionate about, the thing that you are already expert at, the thing that you've already invested in education and training, right? Like that that opportunity is available in in cannabis today, whether you are an electrical engineer or a podcaster, yeah. right? Or a chef, you know, a bookkeeper, a an accountant, right? anything. Like the opportunity exists today in this industry. Like we are at the very, very beginning. And so I think that, you know, an often overlooked, so there's so much focus on licensing and, and plant touching businesses. And I think what's often overlooked is that there's a real opportunity to, to participate in, in the industry and in, in all of these other ways. Um, there are going to be some really phenomenal mechanical engineers that, I mean, if you think about it, like indoor cultivation is all about mechanical engineering. It's, a, it's, it's, it's mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineering. Like that, it's, and so if we, you know, there's so many people who can just focus on the thing that they're already trained to do, that they're already passionate about, and still participate in the wealth that's being created by the end of Prohibition. Yeah, I couldn't agree. I'm actually dealing with that right now with a local HVAC company. They're, they're doing their first, you know, big cultivation build out for us. And it's like they already have all the infrastructure, all the talent. And it's like, we want to try this project out. And it's like that goes for any other occupation, any other profession out there. Yeah, absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Uh, so what do you think is the biggest challenge we face for a successful rollout of the market in New York State? I think that, I mean, look, New York has been really audacious in the way that it is embracing not only social equity, but also this concept of, of, of bringing the legacy market into, you know, not creating a not creating an adversarial, trying to avoid the adversarial relationship between the legacy market and the and the, the, the regulated market. And at the same time, historically, New York has been one of the most highly regulated markets in the country. And those concepts seem difficult to mesh. I think the good news is that you've got an OCM that is led by really principled people and an office, I'm sorry, a, a cannabis control board, again, that's led by really, really principled people who are thoughtful about this and are recognizing that, you know, over-regulation can be a problem, right? And, you know, they, they are careful in how they are crafting. You know, crafting regulations is as much about regulating as it is about designing how a marketplace will operate. And so it's important that the regulators understand that. And I think that these regulators in New York do absolutely understand that, that they're designing how a marketplace will run. And and as long as they sort of keep that in mind, um, I think that the that the challenges are, are fairly easy to overcome. But I do think that, that you know, um, being compliance focused Growing entrepreneurs that are compliance focused in a heavily in such a heavily regulated industry is is I think where the where, where some of the bigger pain points are going to be. I couldn't here. agree more, and it definitely helps. You know, like you said, not only having a very principled CCB and OCM, but having cities with officials like Rochester, the senator, the mayor, the city council people yeah. all on board. That's you know, great, I, yeah. I, I can't really speak to the rest of, uh, of the other bigger municipalities or bigger cities in, in, in Rochester or in the state. We're very lucky here from the top down to have some really good support uh, for an industry that people all really want to succeed. See, succeed. Look, I think I think 
Entrepreneurship is hard under the best circumstances. And cannabis is is unbelie- is an unbelievably difficult business that is only made easier when everybody's rowing in the same direction. And so what's so impressive about Rochester is seeing, again, like the, from the mayor to the city council, the state legislators in the, in the area, everybody's rowing in the same direction. Everybody's on the same page about what it takes to, about the, really it's really about the commitment that they all have to seeing this be successful for the the not just the people of Rochester but particularly for like the the legacy community and like everybody is is rowing in the same on the direction same page. and that's powerful that's really powerful and lastly what's something that's really exciting uh, about either the rollout of the industry or something that you're working on day to day uh, we're working on I mean really exciting projects all over the country um, I'm really excited I think New York is the most exciting market uh, in the country uh, we're hopeful that safe banking happens and this will be you know I'm at like being in the cannabis industry at the moment when you know as as hopefully banking becomes easier and some of these it's just it's just a really exciting time um, New York is it will will lead the way for so many other states and so to to be a part of the industry here in its infancy is just a, a really special opportunity it's like it's like being at the start of the internet I feel like you know we all have this this is a one in a lifetime opportunity for all of us as entrepreneurs, as business people, to really build something for ourselves, for our families, you know, for generations. And, and, and uh, I really think that we're also, and to your point about the your 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 point about the the elected officials in the area, we're really building like and creating a new way of thinking about how an industry like what an industry should look like in the beginning and how do you bring in how do you create a more inclusive how do you make the tent bigger how do you make it more inclusive how do you make it more equitable right like these conversations weren't had at the birth of investment banking right if it if if they had been investment banking wouldn't look like it looks right this is a this is a, a moment when we are creating the like what the path will look like as new innovation and other completely unrelated things happen. This is how the conversation should be had. And so it's just, you know, it's it's great to be a part of it. Next up, Rochester City Councilman Mike Patterson. And maybe it's like, how do we create a safe space for legacy market operators to, to, how do we create a seat at the table for the legacy market operators? Well, so I would, so I think you, I don't think you, from what I'm seeing, it's already coming into existence. Jeff was like, Jeff, you know, Jeff dude, that's the, that's the dude. That is the dude. I don't even think people in Rochester understand it. Like, that's the dude. That's the one who got it going here. So he got it going here. Dish. That's how you do it. You get together, you have a conversation, you figure out what you want, and then you advocate, advocate, advocate for it. This space is a long way from being, this, 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 these issues are a long way from being settled and done. You know, now is the time to get in, raise your voice, and say what you want. And working collectively, it takes the heat off of one individual trying to do everything. Because, you know, and, and you also need some advocates. I would argue you need some advocates in it who aren't in it for anything. Yeah. So that's that's kind of where I've been coming in in this space. It's not that I'm, I, I don't want or expect anything out of it. I am not pursuing a license in any way, shape, or form. Not my Nobody in my family is pursuing a license. So we're not, I'm not after this from the perspective of I want to get something. My, my connection to this is I'm a member of the Rochester City Council. We get 3% of the revenue. <laughs> But at the same time, from talking to some of the, from like the Cannabis Street Sellers, Street Entrepreneur Association, I've come to understand that this is a huge industry in my city. I have a chance to surface it, make it legal, make it legitimate, and still, and and recognize people who are locally employed. So if I can take, if I can work, if I can work with folks who already know how to sell cannabis and get you to transition from selling cannabis on a street corner 
to selling cannabis in a storefront, that's a positive for everybody. Absolutely. It's, and, and you know, this, there's this whole conversation like, oh, well, they need training. Like, yeah, no, not really. Um, dudes who sell, sell. They know what they, they you know, like, if you, if you sell this, you know how yeah. to sell this. It's a product itself. Right, right, it pretty you know? much is, you know, and it's, and it's like, and I, and I laugh, it's like, you know, um, you go to, you go to Vegas and the dispensary is open 24 7 it's as big as a Wegmans and what do you see you, you see bud tenders who speak intelligently about their product like baristas like, you know? yeah, better than a barista because yeah. I don't have a conversation about my coffee no. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm just like yeah I just sent it in like boop boop yeah. there it is and I'm out the door yeah, like yeah, I ain't got to yeah, talk so about right. it you go there man you gotta you gotta almost know what you, you gotta know what you're doing yeah. otherwise it's like if you're like hey I just want some weed what for yeah like like literally, what do you mean? What for? Uh, Did I have choices? Yeah, I mean, does it, well, you know, do, are you are you trying to concentrate? Yeah. Do you need to study? Yeah. Or do you just want to blot out the world? Yeah. What do you like? Yeah. It's a whole yeah. damn conversation. Yeah. I'm sitting yeah. here watching, like, wow, this is this is way more than I like. Get out your notebook. I, like, I'm li I'm literally sitting here, like, I don't have the, I don't have this much conversation about legislation. Yeah. <laughs> no, like, this is way too yeah. much talking. Yeah. But you really have to be informed in that job. So okay. That ain't no different than what these cats is doing out here, and you have to know the product. And I'm like, so let me see if I get this straight. You get paid to smoke weed? Yes, yes, sir. I get paid to smoke weed. Well, that's impressive. So you've got to know the product. You got to sell it. Oh, and good job to me. So, 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 so that's the and that's the lower level of it. You know, the other part of it for me is the equity piece of it. When I say equity, I'm literally talking about the way it seems as though the way the law is set up now. You want to turn black and brown owners into workers. But they're not interested in being workers. They're a boss now. I want to stay a boss. Yeah. I'm running a business now. I want to run a business. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go and work for somebody else. I don't want to go sell out to whoever, yeah. you know, but it, but but the question is how are we going to create a process that's going to be inclusive so they can be a boss? And that's the thing. It's like, and we also have to create access to capital that isn't only under the wing of venture capital because there there goes ownership. Claim. Well, you know, and it's well, you know what, here's here's the funny thing about talking to some of the legacy market folks some of them are like bruh money ain't no problem we got money the problem is we ain't got a way to get the money in yeah so that's yeah. So, the, so the challenge is how well oh okay well how do you get the money so their whole thing is like no 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 wait 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 just so so I, there's segment there's segmentation to this you know so the question is if we're serious about servicing an industry you got to take it all. Yeah. You got to take. You, you, you got to take the people, and you got to take the money. You got to find a way to make that money, for lack of a better. No, I'm not going to say it like that. You got to find a way to make that money bankable and acceptable. Yeah. Okay. And if if and so you know we it seems as though we bought into the notion of expungement. Well, if we bought into the to the notion of expungement, I see this as a reparations issue for the legacy market folks. And I keep saying legacy market for a reason. In most instances, when we're talking about cannabis, a lot of folks want to just stay focused on black and brown. Well, there are a fair number of folks out here who are not black and brown, who are involved in the legacy market. And if we are serious about creating a market in New York State, we need all hands on deck to make a diverse and profitable market. We've got to collaborate. We've got to bring everybody in. And, 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 for, and to the degree that we do the work to bring those folks in, that are already out here, our market will be that much more successful. Yeah, I think we, you know, we talked about before is, you know, how do we give legacy market people a seat at the table without feeling that, you know, you're putting a target on the back. Yeah, right. yeah, that's a real, that's a real concern. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, you know, I've done a lot of advocacy in my day and, and over the last couple of years, and you know, you don't see a lot of legacy market people showing up to these town hall meetings because why would you? You know, I'm staying. You know, if I'm a legacy market person, I'm staying. As far away from that as, as possible. Right. How do we give, make them comfortable? How do we give them a seat at the table to the make that? So the way you, the way we, I'm not going to say the way we do it because I'm I'm not a, I don't believe in doing for people. I believe in doing with people. 
So we come together and we have the conversation and we work with them to build structures so that they can put somebody out there to advocate for them. So I, you know, basically it's a trade association. You know, so so the, the key and the challenge is going to be to build a trade association for legacy market folks so that you ain't got to tell, you know, you, you build some kind of see whatever structure. You throw your money in, they do the advocacy, and they have no obligation to disclose. In my mind, that's how you do it, and this ain't rocket science. So, so we, we you do that, you go forward, and you advocate, advocate, advocate. You know, but I I honestly get you know the whole thing of you know I'm the rabbit, and there's a meeting of the wolves, and you yeah. want me to go to that yeah. meeting? Nah, nah. No, thank you. No, sir. No, 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 no. I'm no. not going. No, I'm not going to be lunch. Thank no, you very no, much. No, thank you. I'm gonna say far away from that. Right. What is uh, before we wrap up? What is one thing that you're most excited about for the city of Rochester, especially uh, when it comes to rolling out the cannabis industry? What I'm really excited about is that as a community, we are really starting to have, we, we have been having in-depth, comprehensive conversations about what this thing is going to look like. You know, we are, we have adopted the notion that we are going to be the flower city. You know, just so, sense, right? so we've always been the flower city. Yeah. We, no, we, really we, we, we've always been, now we just another flower baby, yeah. we grow it all. Yeah. So yeah. that's what we're going, yeah. we grow. Yeah. That's it. It might, hmm, huh. Rochester, flower city, we, we grow. grow. That yeah. might be the model. Maybe a good sign. <laughs> right. in the town, you know? <laughs> we're, we're <laughs> <laughs> Got that bud. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that ain't a bad idea. That's a good idea. All right, brother. Thank you so much for your time. It's oh, good anytime, to see you. Man, Thanks for everything you're doing. Good to be seen. Oh, yeah. Just working, brother. Yeah, Just working. All right. It's appreciated. Oh, right. Good work. Thank you. Appreciate you. Yep. And last, but certainly not least, New York State Senator, a.k.a. Mr. Cannabis, Senator Jeremy Cooney. Uh, so really what I wanted to hone in on today is 280E. Uh, so can you explain to me what exactly is 280E and how does it impact cannabis businesses? So 280E is actually a federal IRS code. That's where the 280E comes from. And what it does is it prohibits a cannabis business because a cannabis drug is still a Schedule One drug on the federal register, right? It prohibits uh, a business from deducting what we call ordinary and necessary business expenses on their state and federal taxes. Our legislation at the state of New York level is modeled after what California did after falling into a little bit of a pitfall and realizing that the inequity in taxes was not allowing everyone to participate in their market. So our legislation decouples uh, this legislation so that uh, if you are in doing business in the state of New York, you are able to deduct uh, your necessary and ordinary um, business expenses on your state taxes, not your federal taxes, on your state taxes. But what that does is that if you're making a widget here in Rochester or anywhere else across the state, you get that benefit already. So it's just equalizing the opportunity to do businesses in New York. So you're only able to write off COGS or cost of goods, right? So the product, if you're if you're growing or selling, right? But if you're if you're uh, renting a building to do a retail location, if you have gas costs if you're in delivery yeah. right if you're payroll costs yeah. if you're hiring sales folks yeah. right you can't write that off any place and that really cuts into your profits and we want you to be pioneers in this new adult use recreational marketplace and we want to incentivize everyone to be able to participate so taxes is an important part of that conversation now i think we're going to get this done uh, we wrote the legislation a while ago, um, but we are in the final few days of the budget negotiation, and we're hoping that this 280E legislation at the state level will get passed in the New York state budget, which means it would be ready to go as the new market opens up. And I think this is something, you know, as a cannabis business person, this is monumental for entrepreneurs and cannabis business owners alike. I think a lot of people have been focused on the question, are when are licenses come out, when are regs come out, and some of these other very important things are kind of being over uh, you know overlooked but I want to you know let everybody know this is monumental from a business perspective this is a, a really huge opportunity uh, for cannabis businesses so thank you for pushing this and spearheading this because I know personally as a cannabis business owner it's gonna be huge for me it's gonna be huge a lot of my colleagues and uh, we're very thankful 
let me just say this. Everyone's talking about infrastructure these days, roads, bridges, right? We are building the infrastructure for adult use recreational cannabis in New York. And 280E is a critical part of that infrastructure. Absolutely. Now, let's talk a little bit about cannabis banking. You started to talk about cannabis banking uh, in your speech just a few minutes ago. What are some of the challenges that banks face when it comes to uh, banking with cannabis businesses? So this is also part of that infrastructure that we need to build out in New York State as we prepare for a vibrant uh, retail marketplace. So right now, banks and, and really all financial institutions, so that includes credit unions, right now cannot legally uh, transact business with a cannabis company without complying with very stringent standards on the federal level. So without going into all the details, every single time you make a deposit or you pay a bill from your checking account from a cannabis related business, they have to file papers with the Department of Treasury. This is about anti-money laundering and all that kind of stuff. So that's important to do. It's, it really came from the Patriot Act and the SAFE Act, right? And so we want to make sure that banks who say, you know what, I don't want to be part of cannabis, are incentivized to think about supporting and lending and banking with uh, adult use recreational cannabis licensee holders because it's a good for them, it's good for the community, and it's about safety too. We want people to who are in this industry to have have a place to safely put and deposit their funds. And so we're going to be coming out with some legislation in a couple days, a little, little insider tip here, Good. Steve, but uh, we're going to be writing some legislation that will help make that relationship a little bit easier between a bank or a financial institution and a potential cannabis customer. We can't overrule what the federal laws are, but what we can do is make it easier for their due diligence, which lowers the cost to the cannabis customer and, and hopefully client. You know, we see all these crazy numbers coming out, you know, from projected numbers, five to six billion dollars. But we, what we also know about this industry, it's still an all cash business. And you and I know something about all cash businesses is that you're only ever seeing a portion of the pie, you know. So imagine, you know, once we start being able to lever leverage the banking system and the credit system and how even when you can just take your daily cash and put it in a safe, you know, a, a deposit box or in, in a checking account. You know, a lot of these in, uh, uh, businesses in other states, they're walking around with gobs of money and that puts a target on your back. So not only do we want to have these businesses be able to do business like normal businesses, but we also have to protect them. So this seems like well, a great it, you, you just hit the nail on the head. They are a normal business. We have to get over this stigma. We passed the MRTA or the legalization bill almost a year ago. And yet we still separate cannabis businesses from X, Y, or Z businesses. We want you to do business in New York, period, full stop, right? So we want to make sure that you have the same access to opportunity as if you were building a widget in, in, in the city of Rochester. So banking, taxes, are really important infrastructure components to building up this industry. And I think from a, there's a, a timing matters on this because what we want to do this upfront. So before everyone starts applying for these retail licenses, we want to make sure that they know for, what they're getting into, right? And getting the benefit of that and feeling confident that they're going to be successful in the New York market. And let's be honest, running any sort of business is tough. You know, a small percentage yeah, of definitely. entrepreneurs that actually, you know, will actually make it. And when you add in the compliance and the red tape of cannabis, it makes it even more difficult. So if you layer on, you know, even if you have the best idea or the best product, if you got to, you know, jump through all these hoops of can I bank, can I do all this, it's it's setting people up for failure. So it's really good to see that not only are we looking to get regulations out in a timely fashion and licenses to, out to the right people, but we're looking at banking and the credit system and all that so we can actually do business as real business owners. And remember, this is a full circle. When the individual retail holder or cannabis business owner does well, so does the community. Because part of the state tax revenue goes right back into local communities, 40%, yes, right? And the rest goes to education and, and, and drug treatment programs. These are all good things. Yes. So when you as a New York business win, so does the community. Absolutely. And we want to incentivize that from day one. Absolutely. Now you, outside of banking, what is another challenge that you see uh, in the rollout of a new industry in New York like this? So we've been really focused on the social equity components, but what we haven't heard is a real commitment to the legacy market. And we want to make sure that we can build a real pathway um, from legacy to legal. And we want to make sure that those folks who have really very successful businesses 
uh, can, uh, lots of um, clients and customers, right? Maybe they have their own brands, yeah. Yeah. right? That they can bring that into the new legal marketplace. But we have to be intentional about that. So when we talk about social equity components, right? Maybe those who've previously been incarcerated for a marijuana drug offense, or uh, those who are a minority status or live in a certain community, right? Those are all good things. Those are about repairing the harm from the war on drugs. What I'm talking about is building acquisition and building the marketplace in New York State with the legacy market players. We need them. We, we need them to be successful. They are the market, right? And so we want to incentivize them to bring their book of business into the state of New York. That keeps them safe. It keeps our consumers safe, but it's also the right thing to do. And so I want to propose uh, some legislation in the future that will make that easier and make that pathway a little clearer and send a message to every legacy operator in the state of New York that we see them, we know their value, and we want them to be successful in the new marketplace. And I'll tell you this, I don't think that there's been a single state that's been effectively able or successfully able to bridge the legacy and legal market. I think we really have an opportunity to do it right and be the first in every other state that's existing within an existing market and all states to follow, to follow in our footsteps, because that, I believe, is the single most important thing to a successful rollout in a flourishing industry. That isn't just two years of you know retail dispensaries and everybody flocks back to the illicit market because it's too pricey you know, but uh, if we can do that, which I think we will, I think we'll be the shining star of the, the nationwide well, cannabis I've, industry. I've said it before and I'll say it again. New York has the opportunity to lead on this nationally, right? We were not the first state in the nation to go through this process, obviously, um, but we are one of the largest states. We have an opportunity to set the standard, the gold standard, the green standard for what the rest of the country will look like. And by the way, every other state is looking at us, right? So even states that are going through the same process like New Jersey, they're looking at us. Right? States that haven't made that plunge, Florida and Texas, they're looking at New York. And so we got to get it right. It's not just uh, you know, an opportunity, it's a responsibility to do this right from the get-go. And what it really excites me, especially as a Rochesterian, is not only do we see the excitement at the highest level, at the Senate, at the House, and even at the governor's desk, but we have local officials who are just saying, you know, Mike Patterson, M Mayor Evans, like everybody from from all aspects of representation are just as excited and rowing the boat, you know, in the same direction. So I know that I'm personally very excited about Rochester in particularly. I know that the other cities, but quite frankly, this is my home. What is something that you're most excited about over, you know, to happen over the next year as the industry starts to roll out? Jobs. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity for Rochester. We've gone through some really hard times and a lot of times the jobs that come to our region, which are really good, aren't necessarily accessible to everyone who lives in our neighborhoods and in our city, right? Transportation issues, uh, education and skill level issues, right? These are jobs that people can get and they can actually provide a living, a good living to their family. This is how we create generational wealth. This is how we break poverty in our community. One out of two children still live below the federal poverty line in the city of Rochester. That's unacceptable. Now this isn't the only solution. Good education, more good paying jobs, better public transit, all of these things contribute to having a healthier city. But when you inject economic opportunity into the neighborhoods that have not seen that for decades, we are changing the game. And it's Rochester, more so than other cities, is going to benefit from this. And I'm going to make sure that everyone who has the opportunity, who wants to be part of this marketplace, is going to have the opportunity to get that license. Senator Cooney, we're very lucky to have you. Thank you. Thank you again for your time. I really appreciate everything. Thanks for your leadership. Appreciate Great. it. Yeah. Thanks to our friends here at Rockbox Recording and Production in Rochester, New York. They are a full professional podcast and video studio designed by a radio guy for podcasters. Audio, video, voiceovers, editing, whatever. Mouth off at Rockbox at rockbox.com. You can follow Cannabis Cum Laude on LinkedIn and all other social media platforms, as well as Cannabuzz. And if you'd like to help support the show, search up Cannabis Cum Laude on Patreon. And of course, all of those links are in the show notes. Thanks for watching and listening.